I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And, and this, this is Celebrity, Celebrity Memoir Book Interview Club, the time. author interview. <laughs> we have something special today. I guess we're kind of the Barbara Walters of our generation because we've now done up to three interviews. We are very excited to welcome our guest into the studio, into the literal studio. This is our first in-studio interview, actually. Yeah, I'm excited to have her here. It was so nice of her to come out to Ridgewood, but she has a car. Yeah. But parking can be a nightmare, but we are so lucky to have her. We're so happy that she came and did this. We're so excited to share this. Really, I don't know if I'd call it a fun convo, but it's like a thoughtful convo. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoy it. And without further ado, please welcome Julia Fox. I am so excited to invite to our studio here in Ridgewood, Queens, the one and only, the author, Julia Fox. Ah, hi, guys. I'm like kind of freaking out because I see you guys like on the phone all the time, like every day. And now you're in person and it's so cool. Can I say I'm freaking out because I just read your whole book and like I finished probably an hour before you walked in. And it is such an emotional roller coaster that I was almost like, how am I going to look at her now that I like, yeah. I feel like I read your diary. I feel like I like just talked to a friend and she's like, well, here's who you're about to meet. And now I'm like, does she know I know this much about her? <laughs> I was like, that was quite the journey. I'm like, I need to take a deep breath so we oh can have a convo. God. Yeah. Our first question, just because we both in the last 24 hours have read your entire book, which packs a lot in. How are you? Because you lived it. Yeah, I'm good. I've been getting that question a lot recently from people that read it. Like, just how are you? You know, and it's like, I'm good. You know, I mean, it's like, all this stuff is, I guess, part of like my DNA, my my foundation, you know, but it is the past. So it, it only has as much power as I want to give it to, as I want to give to it. And, you know, I'm very big on like, you know, you got to keep going forward because otherwise you like let all these assholes win. And I would never, there my ego could never. Assholes. Yeah, there's a lot of assholes. But I've been an asshole too, you know, like it goes both ways. We play the game. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask, so the timeline of this book is pretty recent. When did you stop writing it? Like how much distance do you have from page 318? So I stopped writing it. Um, I wrote it like at the very end of 2022 and the be very beginning of 2023. So like a couple of months ago was like the last time I like wrote anything in there. Um, so yeah, it is pretty recent and I just felt, cause it was all very relevant and like, you know, ultimately it's just the truth, you know? And I felt like, obviously it's not everything though. Like this is really like the tip of the iceberg. Yes. I feel like each chapter could have been its own book if I really went into the nitty gritty and if I really like did that, but it's like, you know, I want to write a book that like people can just like read and it doesn't take up their whole lives. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So how do you pick which stories go in and which don't? When you were going through the memories, I guess I was just kind of like thinking very like pragmatically, like which story helps push the the story forward. You know what I mean? Wow. So men, men memoirists. <laughs> <laughs> men. Listen to that idea. <laughs> I don't know how you knew to do that because it's all we've ever asked from people. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> I guess that's why we loved it. <laughs> well, I wrote it, you know, knowing that people would be reading it. So I wanted it to like make as much sense and try to have some like cohesive like threads running throughout the whole thing so each chapter isn't so like isolated and on its own like in a narrative arc yeah <laughs> like exactly. telling the story of how have I gotten to now and have you always wanted to write a memoir what really took you to the page and said we're making this project I happen did. and I honestly growing up like people would always tell me like you should write a book you should write a book like or you should make a movie about your life or like you should be an actress like people always told me all the things but I guess I just had like such low self-esteem that I was like, no, like that could never happen for me. But there was a little voice that was like secretly holding on and like hoping that maybe it could come true, you know, but I just didn't have very like high self-esteem and I didn't think that something like this could happen for me because it's so crazy. Can I ask a question? Because I am so interested. Me and Ashley always talk about the it factor who has it, why it's not us. <laughs> and I do think something that comes through in your book and obviously from the accomplishments of your life is you have it. And I always assumed it was a self-confidence. But as you said, there's a lot of times in your life you have felt very insecure. What would you say is about you? What is the thing that people look at you and go, it's going to be you, something's going to happen? Well, I think that a lot of time when people project confidence 
Or a lot of the time when people project anything, even being like very kind or very kumbaya or very whatever, it's because there is a lack of it. And I just saw this as an example with um, Uba from Roni. She's on this trip with the girls and she's reading this like self-help book. And it's like something about like peace and calm and serenity or something like one of those books, you know what I mean? And I remember thinking like, "Hmm, that's so weird that she's reading that. And then she like loses her shit over like the smallest thing ever. And it's like, fully like that was the most insane meltdown I'd ever seen in my life. So it's like a lot of the time, you know, when we're, when I'm projecting this confidence or whatever, it's because I know that I'm lacking it. So I'm like going extra hard to like make it seem like that's not, you know, get what I'm saying? Yeah. Fake it till you make it. It's literally fake it till you make it, you know? And I don't even realize I'm doing it. I'm not like, oh my God, I have to like pretend to be confident right now. It's just like a switch that comes on and I'm like just doing it. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask is like, is it a conscious switch? No, it's so like learned and so ingrained. And I think, I think probably a lot of women do it too. Like even we were just talking about like being uncomfortable and, you know, because we feel uncomfortable, we start like doing things to like project comfort. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I'm not like bothered by this at all, you know, but it's like, oh, you know, and you feel like you're like dying inside. Do you think, because I feel like you saying that it's like just inherent and learned and it seems like you learned it really young because working as a dominatrix when you were 18 years old and you talk about stepping into the room for the first time. And I mean, you write about being insecure, but it seems that you were able to like snap into that character because, you know, you were very successful. And I was going to say, yeah. do you think it's from like the lack of like center in your childhood? For sure. And I think when I feel like I spent my whole childhood just like in fight or flight and like looking for any little thing to like soothe me and make me feel better. Like the hair dryer was like my first addiction and sugar, sugar on my hair dryer. <laughs> yeah. But it was like, you know, I was always just kind of looking to like check out or feel better. And I was always in survival mode. And I think that when you are constantly in fight or flight and you're always just trying to survive, you just eventually you learn how to like tune out and shut off everything, the good thoughts, the bad thoughts, just everything and kind of like mask as this whole other person. And that's why I think it was so easy for me to like cross my own boundaries or like you know, violate whatever moral compass, ethical code that I maybe whatever, like, it was just very easy for me to like, do things that were compromising to myself, because I could so easily just shut that part off. But then when I no longer had to do that, and I could actually see myself for who I really was, it was like a lot at one. It was just like, oh, my God, like, I did all these things, like, such a shitty person, I feel so ashamed. And And then I tried to be like the polar opposite, you know, and now I've just landed somewhere in the middle where I'm like, this is who I am. I'm not ashamed. And I think that just comes from like wisdom and knowing that like, even though the book is crazy and like a lot of crazy things happen, ultimately, it's not that unique. Like so many girls will be able to identify with at least one aspect in there, you know. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, they're like extreme versions. And I think the age, like sometimes you'll be talking about a situation and then you'll be like, Anyway, I was 12 and I'm like, what? 12? But I do think, I don't know a woman that's never been put in a situation or fallen for somebody with the ups and downs Mm -hmm. or the situation that I was thinking about specifically when you call out Shane and then lose all your friends. Yeah. I mean, we've both been there. That is like my comedy origin story was like calling someone out, losing all my friends, having nowhere to go and then like going to open mics. (laughs) Yeah. I want to dial it back to the beginning. Your relationship with your parents is obviously Mm -hmm. very central to who you are. And I think something different than the standard is you were mostly living with your dad. Your dad was your primary parent. Yeah. And you seem to this day to be closer to him. Yes. And I think that's different than a lot of people's experience with like the single mom raising the child alone. I was very interested in your relationship with your mom and who she was. And I found it interesting that you don't really give their childhood story. Like we're not given the context of how did they get to here. So was that like a choice you made as a writer? Like, did you consider explaining them as people? I probably should have now that you mention it. It's also your story. Yeah. Well, because it is very important. My dad's parents were both like, his dad was autistic, his mom was bipolar, and I don't think that he was treated very well. He tells me stories that are like so like, and he like recalls it like laughing and like, oh, you know, like that's his personality. But like there was one where they like sent him off to some like military school or something, but like didn't pay for the boarding. They only paid for the school. 
so he was living in like somewhere in New England, like, I think like Massachusetts or something. And he would live behind the school in a tent. Yeah. Through the winter, like eating canned foods and delivering papers in the morning and washing dishes in the evening and using that money to just like buy food and like whatever he needed. And then he would get bullied a lot. And 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 he's not unpacked that at all. Um, and then of course, when you've lived that as a kid, I think they probably always say, oh, and when I'm a parent, I'll never. But yeah. then in the back of their head, they go, but I survived it. So I know it's survivable. Exactly. And also when you like don't unpack your trauma, you tend to just like repeat it on a loop. And I, there was a time, I actually don't write about it in the book, but I feel like I really should have put it in because there was a time in my like early 20s when he had this moment, we were just walking down the street, like walking the dog. It wasn't even, you know, nothing had happened. And he looked like almost like he was about to cry. And he was like, I just want to say, I'm sorry. I don't think I was such a good parent. Yeah. And I was like, oh, it's okay. Like I turned out okay. Like, don't <laughs> worry. Out. Yeah, it's fine. Like I wouldn't change anything. It's fine. <laughs> exactly. It's good. It, it's, it'll be great for my memoir one day. <laughs> but then like years later, when I would confront him about stuff, it was like complete denial. And like, what are you talking about? You had a great childhood, blah, blah, blah. How and it's like, you think that? Really? <laughs> like I, I, my brother has like diagnosed PTSD, like severe PTSD. Like we're all like, so not okay. But, you know, you have to, you know, the denials, yeah. how people survive sometimes. And then and by denying it, you can create your own reality. And you're exactly. Yeah, that's so interesting. I know. And then my mom, yeah. she like, I think just grew up very poor and she was raised by like her grandmother while her parents worked. And her apparently her grandmother was like a very kind of mean lady. And she was an only child, no cousins, no nothing and she's just very like cold today, you know, like I, she's not a very, like she's actually way more affectionate to my brothers and like they ha do have a relationship I with her. I think that's a very common mother son. Yeah, an Italian woman thing for yeah. sure. I was going to say, I'm like, I feel like Jews and Italians are very similar yeah. and like oh, Jewish moms sure. love their sons. <laughs> oh, for sure. Like for instance, I would like I remember I think I like had just given birth a couple of months had gone by I might have still been like heavier and she's like telling me to lose weight meanwhile her other son is actually morbidly obese like actually and doesn't leave his room for weeks at a time and like you know what I mean but I'm the problem yeah. you know what I mean it was just like little things like that and at the time I would like kind of just like shrug it off like whatever like this is who she is and then when she started like making the comments about my son that was when I like cut her off. I was like, oh, wait, no, this isn't going to work anymore. You know, like, at the, like, it's just not going to happen. I have a question about your parents. How did they meet? Because <laughs> yeah, it seems in the book that they were kind of never in the same place for like most of your life. No. And they like hate each other. If they are in the same place, they're just fighting, like abusing Why each other. Why are they still together? Like, I cannot believe they've eaten out. I think it's out. like a convenience thing. Are they still together? They're technically still married. Okay. Huh. But I did, like they're not like together, you yeah. know what I mean? But also like my mom met him when she was 18, when she was like an au pair here in America, like teaching Italian and, you know, babysitting and she met him at a party. And so like he's been in her life longer than he hasn't, you know what I mean? So I feel like and it's also a tr weird trauma bond, yeah. like because she does call on him and like needs him for stuff and he doesn't really call on her, but he does like listen to her and like obeys her but then also like then rebels and like does weird like it's I don't know it's such a weird dynamic and it's it's so toxic like it's like the most toxic relationship I've ever seen in my life like it's so bad it's just so bad and I'm like how is this still going on like I used to beg them to get divorced when I was little like beg I guess there was a small period of time when they lived together in New York how much of your life would you say that you lived with both of them under one roof? Never. No, they like she would come to visit for like a couple of weeks, twice a year for two weeks. And then I'm, and, oh, and then she would come in the summer sometimes too. It was like so little, like in, in total, in total, I've probably spent like if you were to like accumulate all the days, I've probably spent like a year <laughs> with my mom, but, but not when I was living in Italy before I moved to New York, then she was technically my primary caretaker, but she wasn't. It was my grandpa. Yeah. So it, it's still like there wasn't really that much time there spent together either. It's just it was interesting because it's such a reversal. I feel of so many stories where it's the yeah. mother taking care. I would love to hear about your relationship with God. 
I like believe in God. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming you were raised Catholic in Italy. Yeah, but I'm like not religious at all. Like I really shed that mm-hmm. over the years. And I see that now like religion, I think does more harm than good. And and I feel like, you know, if you do have a relationship with God, you don't have to like give all your money to a church and show up, on, you know, it's it's always with you. And I do believe like I don't believe it's like a man in the sky you Mm -hmm. know but I do believe that there is some like greater force that like ties us all together and I believe in like karma and synchronicity and like I I believe in the power of prayer is like really important to me like I feel like that's been kind of something that I've always done ever since I was little was just pray and you know when I was little I was like praying to Jesus but now I just like pray to the universe yeah you know and i feel like weirdly anything i've ever prayed for i've always like gotten yeah and that's why i always tell people like be careful what you wish for because yeah. you'll get it but then you won't take into account all the things that come with it and or how you're gonna get it or you know so a lot of the time like now i don't even really pray for things i want anymore like i just pray to like stay on a good path and just to like be guided and you know, and it helps me feel like less alone and like also like less in control. Because I think that being in control is great, but it's a lot of pressure on somebody. So sometimes I just like give it to God. I'm like, you know, whatever happens, it's meant to be. And even if it's a bad thing, like I've come to find that sometimes like really great things come from bad things, like this book being an example, you know, like sometimes you need a tragedy and it's for, it's to teach you a lesson and, and, you know, you'll be able to turn that tragedy and spin it to your advantage one day. We have a whole section that we want to talk about your female friendships with mm-hmm. you because that's very important to us. And yeah. I almost called you like a like a serial monogamous, but for BFFs. So. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to ask you about the pressure you feel of often being like someone who has in many ways been chosen. Like you have like this kind of incredible, I don't want to say like a lucky life, but like you have had all these amazing things happen and it seems like people are always like, I bet something happens for you and things yeah. happen happening. Yeah. But then the twist of feeling responsible and like specifically in your time dating Rohan and being like, I have to keep my friends housed and employed. Yeah. How have you dealt with that burden? Do you still feel that? Because like when you say like, I'm going to put it up to God, I feel like that's a release of specifically being like, it's my job mm-hmm. to make sure that we all make it. Yeah. Well, I think that like from not being cared for properly, I became very maternal and caring and like, I would just like collect like orphans. So like our house was just like a hub for like misfits and freaks and, you know, people that just outcasts, underdogs. Like that's just kind of always been like the community around me have always kind of been like the other. So yeah, when I did like, you know, get come into some money or come into whatever, like I I felt like it was like my duty and my responsibility to make sure that everyone was going to be okay. And I think that that comes from like wanting also to be taken care of. So if I do it, then there will, it will be reciprocated. And also I have like a chosen family and like, yes, everyone uses the term chosen family, but it's like, I feel like you can only really truly have a chosen family if like you and the other members in your chosen family don't also have very close relationships with their biological families. You know what I mean? Because there's this like understanding of like, we come first, like my chosen family comes before my biological family it, they just do right. you know I mean literally me and Ashley were talking about this before the interview about what we wanted to talk to you about and I like felt that in this book that it was so interesting to me that of course you've had these like kind of all-consuming intense romantic relationships but like the way that even since you were a little girl you have found other women and girl friendships to mm-hmm. be your family yeah like, I don't want to say like, it's only ever happened to you, but it, it stands out in your story compared yeah. to like, the hundred other memoirs I've found. Yeah, had. for sure. No, I, and also like, I think a lot of women would also kind of see me as this like sad little lost child that like didn't have a mother. And so like, like I, I've actually wanted to like write a script about it because in so many different like phases of my life, there was like, whether it was like a friend's parent or like a teacher at school or whatever, but I would have these like surrogate mothers who would like teach me how to like be a woman, you know, makeup, hair, like, you know, any little like tampon, hygiene, like all these things, like they were actually taught to me by these like other women that weren't my mother. One thing that we did notice throughout the book is a lot of your relationships, it feels like both romantic and platonic have had like a sort of codependency that Mm -hmm. also is in partnership with drug use or 
like employment or there are like other factors that factor into like the intensity of the relationships. And throughout this book, you talk about like coming into yourself and like finding out who you are. How have you been able to determine the truth in your friendships and your relationships as you've like shed these external factors? Well, I think the codependency thing was like maybe like an abandonment wound or like something like that. And it's also, I think it goes hand in hand with an addiction because the way that I would like latch on to people, it was like a drug, you know what I mean? And they were giving me the endorphins and it was like, I would just like only want them. Like I'd have my other friends would be like, what the fuck? Like, and I just, sorry, like I only want to hang out with her. And I definitely like have always had that pattern ever since like I can remember, like, I don't know. I just like, if, cause that's the thing. It's like, if I'm going to do something, like it has to be intense and it has to be like earth shattering, soul crushing. Like it has to be like so deep and like, you know, cause I don't like small talk. Like I don't like superficial kind. Like I don't like that type of stuff. Like I only want to like go there with people. How has having a son? Cause you just said like part of it is that you're like, we come first. Yeah. And now you have a son that I imagine is. Well, he fucked up the whole dynamic of everything. Cause now it's like, I can't have those kinds of relationships because if I'm not working, I'm with my son. It's been different, you know, like I definitely like sometimes like miss, you know, having that type of relationship where you're just like your authentic self and like, and that person just like loves everything about you and, and like the bad stuff, the, you know, embarrassing stuff, the, you know, vulnerable stuff. And so, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really engaging in that anymore, but I do have very healthy friendships also, you know, that, Mm -hmm aren't like codependent and and weird. It's not like I have like no friends. I just don't, yeah, I just don't engage in the like, in that kind of thing anymore. intensity. Yeah, like I can't. I'm so stressed about me and Ashley if I I have a kid. I guess we survived bug, but. Yeah, we survived my dog. (laughs) (laughs) Oh babe, the kid is so much crazier than the dog. Were you at all concerned with glamorizing the lifestyle? Because it is hard, I think, when you are like a successful, beautiful woman. Girls are looking up to you. They want to be like you. And part of it is like this kind of like badass, edgy, you have this like crazy childhood. Were you concerned or worried about like the role model aspect of writing this book? I mean, not really. It okay. didn't even really cross my mind. Like just the thought that people look at me as a role model feels so like, well, like it doesn't even cross my mind because it's just like so hard to believe. I'm yeah. <laughs> just like, what? Why? No, don't. Um, but what I would want people to take from it is like you, no matter what situation you're in, like you can get out of it. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like. And you can ask for help and like you can change who you are like tomorrow if you really want to, but it's not going to be easy. You know, it's, it's still going to be a sacrifice and it's still going to be uncomfortable and like all the growing pains and everything, but like anything is possible if like you want it to be. And I also think in a positive way that like, even if you make the same mistake twice, you like don't have to make it a third time. Yeah. Cause I think there are some like patterns that were mm-hmm. like established throughout the book, did you find writing this to be, like, kind of therapeutic and working for those? Oh, my God, yeah. And that's, like, why I wrote it in present tense, too. It was because I literally had to go back in time and, like, place myself there and, like, relive it as it was happening. You know what I mean? And, And doing that, I think, just really helped, like, unpack everything because a lot of the stuff I, like, don't think about or if I do, I, like, immediately knock the thought out of my head. I'm like, that's, like, not yeah. going there, you know? And so, in a way, it was, like, so cathartic and, like, I felt like such a weight was lifted and, um, you know, ultimately, I hope that people don't, like, see it as, like, glamorous because mm-hmm. that it's just, like, real life, you mm-hmm. know, and that, like, this stuff can happen to people and, and it does, but that ultimately, like, you don't have to let that be, like, your your fate. Do you have any, like, rituals or tips, I guess, things that you did when writing? I mean, going back and placing yourself in those moments must have been, like, very traumatic. Did you have anything that you would do afterwards to sort of reset back into your present life? 
No. <laughs> no. It was literally like, because I could only write it on the days that my son was with his dad. Mm-hmm. So I had a very limited time. So it wasn't like I could write like 10 pages a day or no. Like it had to be like, I need to write from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. So I would just write like chunks, like huge, huge chunks at a time. And then after, I would just be like a zombie, like shell of a person. Actually, I don't recommend it. In research, did you call anybody up? Were you working with anybody in terms of just like how do you remember this happening? Like the recollection. I did. I there were like I, I would very casually just be like, hey, do you guys like remember that time? And then like get their perspective on yeah. it, and then that that would like remind me of stuff too, and that was very helpful. But ultimately, it was. It was kind of like a journey I kind of had to go on by myself. I don't know, it just felt like I needed to do it that way. And like, I didn't even ask for like any help at all. Like no editor, no like other writer. Like I, yeah. Wow, you didn't, so you just were going in rereading it yourself? And rereading it and editing it. That was incredible. It was good. Thank you. And well edited. Thank you. Again, we go on record saying this all the time, be like, do not begrudge the use of ghostwriters or editors or We anything. think you should. If you were a writer. You thought yeah, I love writing. So, so, and you've been writing for years. Like, you talked yeah. about an old friend that was a writing partner. Like, you've mm-hmm. been actively in the practice of writing, not someone who once considered themselves a writer and then is like, it's a like riding a bike. You can always write. Yeah, no, it's so hard. Yeah. It's so, so hard. I feel like the hardest part, though, is like, getting your fucking ass in the chair. Yeah. yeah. Like, I would go to the studio where I was writing, and, like, then I would just, like, get on TikTok or, like, start trying on clothes. Sometimes I feel like, for me at least, I spent so much time trying to, like, change myself mm-hmm. instead of, like, adjusting to who I am and just, yes. like, acknowledging my own strengths and, 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 you know, and kind of, like, just using the tools that were just given to me instead of, like, trying to get new tools. Everything is so, like, you know, self-help, like, work on yourself, like, all the, which is great, but, like, ultimately, you know, I I just feel like it's such a waste of time because you're just going to be constantly, like, trying to, like, just go against, like, you know, the natural, like, flow of who you are. Self-help is not really helping who yourself is. It's, like, a, a lesson in how to be... The person society is deemed perfect. Exactly. And I just can't be her, and I wish to death I could be. I like if you're a night person, yeah. like take advantage of that. My know? problem is I'm neither night nor morning. I've got like three good hours in me. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I could get a lot done in those three hours. I know we're like 3 p.m. girls. <laughs> so as a mother, I feel like at the end of your story, you really come to the conclusion of like, you know, I burned it down, I'm down the drain, I'm on the other side, I am who I am. And there is this sense of like there's no shame, there's not necessarily regret. These things happened. I feel like you didn't love all of them, but we're happy with how it came out. As a mother, like, where do you see the grayer? Where, where is the line for you? Because I imagine you don't think that your son is going to grow up in New York City and never smoke weed. I mean, whatever he does, I just want him to know that, like, he can call on me for help. Yeah. I don't want to raise the kid that's like, oh my god, my mom can't find out. Mm-hmm. I want I want to raise the kid that's like, let's call my mom because she'll know what to do. Yeah. You know? And so... I just hope that we have that, like, honesty where he'll just tell me, like, hey, I did so and so and so, and that maybe I can just provide him with some information and some knowledge, you know, but ultimately, like, obviously, I would never want him to do any of the things I've done, but if he does, because we are in New York City, and, like, it's everywhere, you know, whether it's sex or drugs or, yeah. you know, whatever, stealing. Or I mean, you're with homeless people and you're with billionaires. Like, we're all in there doing heroin together. Exactly. <laughs> so you can't really protect anybody. Exactly. So whatever happens, I just hope that he'll be honest with me and, and tell me and, you know, if he is having a problem or struggling that we can, you know, get him help. Like, I just want to raise someone that communicates and knows what to ask for help. In your career, the way you write about it, a lot of things have been very, like, fly by the seat of your pants, like, here's an art show, like, we can fund a fashion line, like, there are just, like, cool projects that sort of come up and you tackle them with, like, a lot of success, but now that you've kind of harnessed a lot of social power in this way, like, people are looking to you and they're excited to see what you do next, what do you want to do next? I mean, ultimately, like, my, my, like, end goal is like get like a production deal like write scripts make movies produce direct children's books like I would like to do more things in in the writing realm because even when I was little and people would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up I would always say like a writer but Mm -hmm. that was like quickly kind of like flushed out of my mind because 
well, you're not going to make any money. Writing's, a, you know, kind of like a dead thing that nobody reads anymore. But I, I don't believe that. And I feel like, you know, there are other things. You can, you can write a movie and people will watch it. Like, it's, yeah. you know what I mean? So we it's read. like, yeah, exactly. You guys read. Like, I read sometimes. Um, <laughs> I buy a lot of books. I just don't read them. Like, ultimately, my, my dream was, like, I just want to have money. Like, I don't, I don't want to be poor. Like, it's not my parents fighting over money all the time. And, I was never getting anything I wanted because we didn't have money. And it was like, okay, like, from a very young age, I was just programmed to, like, get money, get money. And it didn't really matter how it came. And now, to me, it, like, does matter. I'll turn things down if I don't feel like it's morally, ethically, like, aligns with me or who I am. Like, and do you think that comes with your comfortability, like, the fact that you have options now? Or does that come with age? I think it's a little bit of both, okay. you know, because there's definitely people that have money and will still sell their soul for another dollar. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not, like, trying to be the richest woman in the world, you know. I just want to be comfortable, provide for my kid, and it's like, if I'm okay, like, why would I go and, like, compromise my, like, morals? People love to, like, figure out a way to not take anything a woman is doing seriously. Yeah. And I do feel like that oh, yeah. happens to you pretty regularly. And I wonder if you have any tools that you figured out to manage it. Because I know earlier we were talking about confidence and you say that it is this thing that you put on, but it doesn't feel like it stopped you in any way. Like it feels like you just keep going. You keep putting interesting things out there. Yeah. Do you have anything that you do to keep on keeping on? I don't practice anything or whatever, but I, I think a lot of it just comes from like knowing who I am. Like I've gotten to a point where it's like, I know who the fuck I am and like nothing anyone says to me is going to change that. I'm like solid. I'm like a rock, you know, like I just brush things off. And like, ultimately I know that like a lot of the time that people do hate on you or whatever, it's because like they're miserable or you have something they want. And also I feel like with celebrities, like we do this weird thing where like we like project onto them. It's like they're like a mirror for us. And we like to see in ways we're similar and we like to see in ways we're different. And, you know, we do this weird compare and contrast thing. And so I just know that like whatever it is, it's like that person is really sad. And, and I just hope that they like get better so they can stop harassing me, but also for themselves, you know, and so they can stop being like a miserable loser. That's why I, sometimes I block them and I'm like, I'm blocking you for you. Because like, if you keep looking at my page and leave these hate comments, like I'm consuming your brain and you need to move on. It's not good for you to be this hateful. It's kind of fascinating. Yeah. And that's why I like love TikTok. I think it's so amazing. It's really like an app for the people by the people. Yeah. And it's so great. But like, there is this other side where like, there's a lot of fucking trolls on there who like are just so miserable. And it's like, but I don't like hate them. I'm just like, oh, like what happened to you? You know, like but read the book because you can see that there, there's, you can change and you can change your life and you can be a better person. So speaking of reading the book, one thing we've noticed in having read a lot of celebrity memoirs and then afterwards we'll Google them or do some research or see the press circulating about them. There's almost always one random out of context story that honestly is just the buzziest moment and doesn't at all fit into like the greater narrative that the writer is trying to say with this story. And it always pisses me off because people are working so hard on these books and then the press like takes one yeah. buzzy story and runs with it. If you could pick what the headline about your book would be, what would you want it to be? Well, it's definitely going to be something about Kanye for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot believe you didn't sign that NDA. One of the most, I guess, horrible things that I use my voice for is that I like scream constantly into the void that I don't believe in NDAs. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I just, I don't think it's real. I think you can't like infringe upon people's First Amendment rights. Bye -bye. I know it is very strange that that's even like a thing. But I think people are just so scared because they don't want to get into like a 10 year like litigation battle with somebody, you know, and then who has way more money, more money than you than because them. they'll just they'll fucking drown you, you know, and it, it's not right. It's unethical. It's like it's such an abuse of power. It is an abuse of power. Let me ask this. You use the word slither a lot, specifically in your childhood. You're slithering around stealing money from your dad. And I thought it was just to like set the stage of like, you didn't feel great about it. You know what I mean? But then at one point you're like, I slithered on my belly to the ground and I was like, I'm a slither girl. So my number one fantasy in the world is I wish I could just get on my belly and slither around like a snake. Oh, I used to like do that. Like actually. Okay. I just wanted to confirm. Yeah, I feel yeah, yeah. so connected I did to you. That. I did that. I guess Claire, what we're finding out about your wish is that you just don't have the tenacity to make it happen. <laughs> I need to get on the ground and slither like a I just, whenever I'm tired of walking, I'm like, I don't want to be in a car. I don't want to be on a plane. I wish I could just like get on my belly 
and slither home. But like outside though, like on the street. Yeah, if I could have anything, if a oh genie my God, said, I don't any- know about that. I don't know. There's rats out there, girl. I mean, I wouldn't. I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I, I see what you mean. Like if I could get on a skateboard, belly down, and like use my little feet for paddles. <laughs> That would be the most comfortable way for me to get around. I love that. And I feel like you can't run from it because you're over here slithering too. I was doing it. I'm a slither girl. (laughs) Oh, you know what? I thought was the craziest moment in the whole book. What? (laughs) And like out of all the crazy moments when, okay, when that person started that fake IG account about you. So you went to the Instagram offices. I ran up into the Instagram offices. How did you get the idea to do that? How did you know where it was? I know where everything is. My city. And I think they used to be like by like Astor Place, I want to say now. I can't really remember. Actually, it still is. I was just there. Is it still there? Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, I literally, I was on a massage table. My phone started ringing. And at the time, I was very much trying to like move away from like my past. Like it was still very like hush hush. I was doing the fashion line. You know, Nicki Minaj was wearing our clothes and it was like in stores. And I was trying to like present this image that was so not authentic to who I actually was. So I was like living a lie. And my phone keeps going off during this massage. And finally, I'm like, okay, wait, this is like weird now I need to like check. So Leanna calls me and she's like, check your text messages right now. And it's like this screenshot of my like dominatrix profile that used to be online with all my photos and like my specialties, like golden showers, like foot fetish, like ass worship, like all of like just things you like don't want online. And the profile was requesting everybody that followed me, anybody that I followed. And apparently Brianna found out about it because our studio assistant was like, hey, what is this? And like showed it to Brianna. And in that moment, it felt like my like world was like just collapsed. Like this whole, like I was trying to rebuild my life and get away from my like sex worker, criminal, like drug, you know, past. And it felt like it was just getting like shoved back in my face again. And so I kept like reporting the profile and then I was having like all my friends report the profile, but it was like still up and people were texting me about it. And I just ran up in the office. I love that approach. I love like, let's go to the man. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like just make it go away. And they wouldn't let me up. And I was screaming. I was screaming. I, love that. I was like, I'm going to call the police. <laughs> <laughs> on the, like, on the <laughs> yeah, like I went full Karen on the Instagram office, but it was gone. Like a couple of hours, like two hours later, it was gone. Oh, so, so it worked. Yeah. So it worked. But either way, everyone had the screenshot and people were like sharing it around. And then I had to go out that night and um, for a friend's birthday at the Jane Hotel. And so many people were coming up to me, like asking about it. And people thought that like I did it, that I was like, I'm going to be a dominatrix again here. My specialties book me for an hour. It's such a good proof to anybody out there who's like worried about their past or feels ashamed that like your power is in your story. Yeah. But then what we did was we ended up getting like a little feature in ID and it was my first feature in ID and I loved the magazine and I dressed my best friend up in the clothes. And then I like tied her up like Shabari style, like hung her from the ceiling and I did her makeup, I did her glam, I did everything. And then the whole message behind it was like, you know, bullying and and how I like turned being bullied into this beautiful editorial. So that's why like my like literal, like I live my life by like anything that's thrown at you, like repackage it into something beautiful and throw it back. They can't use it against you if you say it first. Exactly. Yeah. And you had that experience again where you put it into a book. Into the art book. Yeah. Because then around that time, I kind of got into a little squabble with these club owners. And I was also part of the club. Did you ever get paid back for that? Never got paid back for it. Yeah. I know. Fucking assholes. Is that club still around? No, it's not. It's like, it's something else now. They like renamed it. But similarly, they were plotting on like starting a website and and like posting all this stuff about me. And um, I had a friend that worked for them and she was my mole and she would tell me everything they were planning to do to me. And so I, I like published the art book with everything and more. And then it was like, okay, what are you going to do now? You know, like I kind of like took all their ammo away. Like you have an energy that draws people, obviously. And so it's going to draw good and bad. Mm -hmm. And so if you just keep on saying like, I'm actively going to embrace good and like take the powers of the people who are trying to fuck you over away, 
That does a lot. And it feels like this book itself, in the end, you talk about feeling a little bit blacklisted Mm -hmm. by the industry. And so this book is almost, again, another art book that like takes your story and repackages it and like is a really beautiful story that you can throw at them and say like, these people who are trying to like control my outcome are what, like 15 pages in your whole life story. Like it's not that fucking important. It's it's like (laughs) so nothing, you know? And also, like, I'm just not going to give them the power to do so. And there's you know? so many avenues to make money. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I feel like with the TikTok for the people by the... Like, it's so true that there's no longer this need to be approved by the... The gatekeepers of the world who are all fucking dinosaurs. I have one friend who will take my paparazzi shots. I'll put it on my Instagram yeah, exactly. and then I'll sell my book. Yeah, exactly. And like all you have to do is like you take a paparazzi shot, you post it on your Instagram and then like that becomes a gateway into like what defines the year. No, I know. I literally watch every single show and I'm like, oh, they got this for me. Like I like see myself in like so many things, which is really cool because it's like I live in a little bubble in my own world and I'm with my son all day and I like forget that like I actually do have influence you know and then I'm I'm reminded I'm like this is really cool like it feels like I'm like really powerful or something even though I don't really feel that way I think this book like helped me understand because sometimes I think you look at celebrities and you go what do you mean you don't think you're a role model what do you mean you didn't know you were like or when they're like you don't understand I didn't know I had any power and it's so hard to believe as an outsider who's looking up to that person But it's true when you are doing it on your own and you're like building it yourself. It's that frog in the hot water thing where you genuinely were like, I don't know, three weeks ago, I wasn't sure if I had rent money. What do you mean? Yeah. And also fame is this weird thing because it's like, I'm not doing it. You guys are. You know what I mean? It is happening to me. You know what I mean? Like, I can't force you guys to Google me. I can't, you know, I can't hold a gun to your head. You guys are doing it. It's just this really weird position because then you have to take responsibility for it. But you emanate this like power and control, which is why I think the you and Kanye relationship is so interesting versus like him and his current wife. I don't think people are that interested. Yeah, well, that's why it only lasted a month, babe. I was like, wait a minute. You want me to do what? Oh, please. But I think because of that part of you, people have a hard time believing that you're not like the mastermind. But then there's the double thing of like women who are so powerful and control all your thoughts are also too stupid to know how to do it. I feel like I fall into that category. They're like, she's so like manipulative, but she's such a dumb bitch. She has a, do I own Hollywood or am I too stupid to write a book? Like how could I be both? Being a mother is so just, it's such a weird place to be because it really is like your heart is like now outside of your body. And like, you just feel so powerless all the time. And like, always worried like about things that are totally out of your control. Before I had a kid, I used to think like you cannot be fulfilled. You cannot really like live out your purpose. I don't know what I was thinking. So you always wanted a kid. You always assumed you'd be a mother one day. I always wanted children. Like I always knew like that that was like the goal. Like I had really like fallen for the lie, you know? And now that I am a mom, I can safely say that you can totally live a fulfilled happy, purposeful life, even without children. Well, that's so funny because that's what I found so interesting about your book is because I think the chosen family thing is so against what society tells women, which is that if you want to be loved, you need to find a husband and a child. Yeah. And the way that you were like always like in these families or in these families of friends and like finding fulfillment there. I found that so interesting. And so then it like, it's doubly interesting to hear that you were like, no, I mean, I was doing it, but I wasn't really believing it. (laughs) Yeah. No, but well, also like, I think that a part of me like maybe wanted to create some sort of family unit, even though I always knew I'd be a single mom. But like, I don't know. I think I just like, I have this like need to nurture and like provide for, and like, I am a caretaker. Like I just am, you know, like it's like, it doesn't sound very feminist of me, but like, I like, I literally spend all day in the kitchen cooking. I'm like baking shit. I make key lime pies once a week. Like, oh my I, gosh, I love no, that. Oh I God, love my key lime, lime pies. Mwah. And it's, it's like, I just have this need, like anyone that comes over, I'm like, food here, t- uh, you know, like I just have that. I think I was like born to be a mom. I don't think it should be like, not feminist for someone to have like a compulsion to take care of people. I think it yeah. should. I think like more people should want to take care of people around and them. Impr- I know exactly. And the community. No, you're yeah. so right. You're so right. Like I don't think you should like lose everything to take care of a man, but I do yeah, think like no, lots that. of people should care about the people around them. It makes us quite happy. I think. <laughs> no, you're totally right, and I think that like the people that are loved by me like really cherish that love and they know that it's like very solid. Like I'm still friends with like my middle school besties and like the people that are in my life are like really ride or die. Like 
they have been tested. They are thorough. Like we cross all the boundaries. There is no personal space. There's no such thing. Like we're like so in each other's like, but it's, it's kind of nice though. You know, it is. No, to have those people that you can like rely on no matter what. I think that like Claire and I met each other when we were in our twenties. And so we're always like, it's never too late to find like a best friend. Cause I think people are always like, well, if I don't have my childhood best friends anymore, then like who are my writer dies? But like, you can always find them and you have to like be discerning and having people like that. Like I know that if I ever needed something, I could like call you and you'd come. Yeah, over. that's the best. And so I think like finding those people and like being there for them and having them there for you is like one of the most important things about like surviving. Mm-hmm. I really couldn't have made it without. And I feel like that's also advice that I give to people a lot is like, just be yourself, like not because being yourself is great, but it is, but like it can also be very isolating, you know, but also like you'll be able to attract people that are like like minded, you know, yeah. so nobody is really that unique ultimately. <laughs> yeah, the human experience is shared. Like yes. we all feel the same. We all cry the same. We all feel, you know, obviously it's unique to every individual, but like ultimately, you know, we're all like connected. Do you feel like fame has impacted your friendships? Are you even looking for friends? Or do you feel like now that you're a name, you're like doors closed, it's hard? I will say that it's sometimes gets a little, like not with like my ride or die besties because they know better, but like I'll have like friends that like ask for favors. Can you do this? Can you do that? And it's like, trust me, I want to, but like I'm so spread thin, you know, like the little time I do have to myself, I have to like, protect that. So saying no is actually so powerful, you know, because you're not saying no to that person. You're just choosing yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And if I said yes to every single thing, like I'd be like emaciated. I'd be like a shell of a human and they wouldn't give a fuck because they got what they wanted. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, so the it's people like, who, like, care are, have well, to be, like... Yeah, no, like, my besties would never, like, they don't ask me for anything. Like, they know that I am, like, at capacity, like, tapped out. It's also kind of different because if they do need my help, I preemptively know it. And I'm right. like, I'm going to do this for you. You know what I mean? Like, it's definitely a little harder because when you're famous, I realize that, like, there's just many, like, yes men around you all the time. And I don't want that. Like, I want people to call me out. I want people to, like keep it real with me. Tell me the truth. Like I need that. I feel like I see it in people who probably would say, oh, I don't want a yes man. But then I go, well, even if you don't want that, everybody here is on your payroll or everybody here benefits from knowing you and they're not going to risk getting into a fight with you right now and not talking for a few months because they need you for money. Exactly. I mean, in the way your relationship with that guy was where it's like there was a certain thing where like I'm sure he didn't want a yes man or like a yes girlfriend, but like he had created created a system. Yeah where you couldn't ever like be yourself around him because it like put you and your friends and your business at risk. Mm -hmm. I think some people become successful and like are extremely lonely because they don't have that like core. Yeah. And so then when they like try to make new friends, they don't even realize that they're like only making. They're making employees. (laughs) (laughs) Also, I feel like, okay, like obviously me and Ashley are nobody, but there have been certain moments where I'm like, oh, you think I'm successful? I'm like, why are you being nice to me? Yeah. And I feel like it is weird when you feel that switch where you're like, okay, you really want to hang out? Okay. I'm like, I'll I'll hang out, but why do you want to hang out? And then I'm like, it's a weird energy to feel. It's it's weird. And you can definitely like pick it up where it's like, wait a minute, like this interaction doesn't feel like the others, you know? Especially if it's someone that I've met before yeah and they did not pay me mind and now do pay me mind and i'm like oh i hate that you're remembering my name now yeah (laughs) oh girl get used to it get used to it but also just like know what's real what's not and like cling on to what's real because it does get lonely at the top (laughs) i believe that and people like always think like that like celebrities are living these crazy lives and blah 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 and it's like all the celebrities i've met are so boring i believe that like compared to like my friends like well they have fun the people you're with you can go the coolest part in the world if it's not fun then it's not fun exactly like there's weird vibes like it's very like lone like it's like there's aren't that many people around like it's also like you can't do anything, you can't go anywhere. It's like yeah. paparazzi, press, and then fans. And the, the, it's like you get like cornered into like 
I mean, nice. don't get me wrong, a castle, you'll be cornered into yeah. a castle and it's nice, sure. But like, yeah. ultimately it's like, that's not fun if you don't have like fun people to share it with. I've been in the Hamptons at beautiful parties with boring people and I said, yeah. I'd rather be at the Jersey Shore with exactly. my best friends and in the Hamptons exactly. with like people that aren't funny. I know. Yeah. Connection is just so important. And like, you know, we really like do need that intimacy and that closeness. And I feel like a lot of that gets lost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also when you think about what it takes to be that successful, it is like not a normal brain. No, 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 no. Male celebrities, people think that they are like talented and female celebrities are like hot and got lucky. Yeah. Most male celebrities got there by like trying really hard and being obsessed with fame. And like no one gives them credit for that yeah like, and you know what shocked me the Kanye thing when he's peeing and you're trying to protect his privacy and it's clear that like he doesn't even care, he doesn't care. I, I feel like people would think you used him for fame he used you I know I've like, like come to terms with that now I think I went into it just so naive like really like so I mean it is captivating and like intense to be like oh this person who I mean like I grew up on his music I was like obsessed with him yeah for him to like single you out and be like you come I'm, to Miami yeah, and then for you yeah. to put stipulations in place for you to be like I can't go unless my friends can come and yeah. him be like okay then I'm, yeah. everyone come yeah no it was like at the time it was like so much in the beginning it was like so much fun it was like thrilling you know it was like I was like high off of it. I mean, of course, of course. We always joke about like Tom Cruise because we read Leah Remini's book about how awful Scientology is. Oh my god! And I'm always like, oh, Scientology, blah blah. Tom Cruise is so evil. I'm like, if Tom Cruise asked me out on a date tomorrow, I would divorce. <laughs> I'd be like, who am I to say no to this? Of course, he's charming. He's like the most popular man in the world. Yeah, I can't say no to that. And then she writes about his courtship with Katie Holmes and like they would go to her and be like, what is your dream date? And she's like, oh, I've always wanted to go like ice skating at Rockefeller Center and then have like a hot chocolate or whatever. And so they clear Rockefeller Center and like all of your dreams to come true in the most yeah. romantic way. And they're famous because they're charismatic. Like you don't get there because nobody is innately drawn to you. Yeah. yeah. No, for sure. You got to keep all the clothes. Of course. That's oh, sick. Amazing. Yeah. That was really nice. <laughs> I can't believe he Kim your ass though. Like when you were like, I've I seen know. this on TV. I know, I know, I know. I was like, I can't believe this is happening right now. Like it's so crazy. But at the time it was like I was so ready to like let go of my life at the time. Also, like I was coming off of like a really shitty breakup with my son's father, and he was like already seeing other people. And I just like I was the one stuck at home taking care of the baby. And he like wasn't at the time putting in the work. Like, I mean, he is now now I'm like obsessed with him. He's so I love great. that line where you're like, he wasn't the best partner for me, but he's the best father to my son. Yeah. And I thought that was such like a beautiful yeah. co-parenting and sentiment. It, it's true. Like, I, I feel like I did get really lucky in that sense. And yeah, at the time I was like really like ready for something really big to come and like just shake my entire life up. I was like, so yeah, exactly. And then it's the same. Be careful what you you wish for. Yeah, Yeah, because I really did like pray for it. I was like, I just I literally I remember like crying and being like, please, God, just like give me anything right now. I like need a miracle to get out of this. Like, I hate my life right now. And I had like postpartum depression and then like dealing with my son's father and like you know, just like feeling so COVID. Stuck. I mean, it's already an insane and it was situation. COVID and I just felt like, oh my God, that I have like no prospects, like nothing. Like what, what is my life going to be? You know, like how am I going to take care of my child? Like I was like in such a like fearful state. So at the time it just felt like, oh my God, my, my dreams come, my wishes were answered. Oh, I ditch Ashley tomorrow. If yeah, you called me, exactly. I'd be like, sorry, I've got a new belt. I'm out. I know. And I think people really like I don't know what they expected of me. Like they like, uh, like, I think you did pretty well considering no, that you were if like, I, if, you I, can't if, have I my would, life. if I could do it all again, I would, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I don't regret any of it, you know? And I think it was a really like big learning curve too. For yeah. Me, you know, and I also think that like your experience, yeah, it was like a crazy month, but it was like a drop in a bucket. Like yeah. I, I like literally forget sometimes yeah, that it happened. So like, and then I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. Ah, you know, because so it's funny. like, because I just so. It's one of those things where you're like, oh, there was like this crazy January. <laughs> yeah, it was a crazy January and that's it. I think this book is really important in kind of not necessarily rewriting the narrative, but I think a lot of people have, when someone becomes famous, they have the lens that they know them as famous yeah. for. So it's, you know, Uncut Gems, Kanye. Yeah like a couple different things. And so I think that like writing them into one narrative and being like, no, 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 but there's like a greater story of my life because you don't view yourself in that way. But 
for people to have an opportunity to sit down and like take in it more was of like the story. A, it was like a slow, gradual, like incline, you know? And I was always like a hood celebrity. Like uh, ever since I was like a teenager, like everybody knew me, yeah. you know, like. I can't believe Julia Fox is your real name. Yeah, I know. And I think that was part of it. Like also having this name, like even like the cops in the neighborhood, like knew me, like knew my name. Like, yeah. And they, they would say like, you know, I have a very memorable name. And I remember one police officer even said that, that it could work against you or for you, you know, whatever, you know, was the name I had. I, I didn't even think about it, but I think it was probably a good thing. Yeah, yeah <laughs> <You know>? definitely. <laughs> the way you wrote about it really humanized Kim to me, actually, yeah. ironically, because I think you see, like, we look at all the PR stuff and I feel like we're always like analyzing like what's really happening. But you forget, like, even though they are doing it for fame and notoriety, like, the fallout is real. To yeah. think about his ex-wife, who is so famous and so powerful, seeing you and being like, well, you know what I heard? And, like, getting on the phone and being like, you don't even, like, I'm just yeah. like, oh, my God, we're all teenage girls when yeah. it comes to our boy. Like, if you have a crush, you could be a billionaire. You could be famous. You could be the Pope. Mm -hmm. You have a crush on somebody that like someone else. You're like, well, I heard that she does drugs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Her ass isn't even real. Did I you know, know that about her? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I'm like, I love that she's, like, warning him about you. I'm like, yeah, in the relationship that's the problem yeah that's the long-term issue here i don't think it was that she was warning him i think that it was that kanye got really fixated on pete being a drug addict and she said well your girlfriend also has a history with so-and-so interesting that, that was from what he told me that was like what i had deducted i don't think she did it in like a malicious way i think okay. she did it in like uh you know Remarkable. don't don't throw stones kind of way you know yeah. and that's why it was so important to him then because suddenly yeah. he was like and now i've lost the higher ground on here yeah baby yeah, yeah. and that was like kind of when it started to feel like very shaky do you feel that you were like a response to pete for sure. Now, I guess for I, sure. It's so funny because I feel like at the time it was so important yeah. culturally. And now I'm like, what was the time? Yeah, I know. Like, who gives a shit? There? You know, it's there was so, like, how many stupid. articles were written about like the oh timelines. I, I know, I know. And then people were like, just kind of being like, well, you, you know, you're only famous because of Kanye. And it's like, babe, he had like a thousand girlfriends after me. Can you even name one of them? No. Like, no. I forget he's married all the time. I'm like, yeah, random. Why? Exactly. And also he was living for the amount of press that of I was getting. Like he couldn't oh, believe no. it. He was like thrilled over the moon. And at the time I was like, okay, but okay, whatever, you know, who cares? Like, but now in hindsight, I'm like, oh, it's because he was like weaponizing me and like using me to hurt a woman who like, I actually love and admire. And I felt really like shitty. And then I was like, this is actually making me feel bad. And I even told him, I have it in a text message. I said, hey, this isn't fun for me anymore. I don't think I want to do this anymore. Once something stops being fun and like, I'm starting to feel bad about myself, like no amount of money, no amount of fame, no amount of anything. Like, I don't want fame for the sake of fame. I want fame for like the opportunity to have fun. And to have fun. And if I'm yeah. not having fun, then I want to get out. Exactly. I also think it's just like another fucking mirror on society that, that people talk about you as like you dated Kanye to get famous but no one says that about Pete who has continuously like dated famous women for attention I know since. like that's his whole fucking thing I know and it's also like I've dated plenty of celebrities I didn't even put them in the book because I just didn't even it was yeah. so irrelevant and stupid but it's like, I never called the paparazzi on us. Like I never, like if I wanted to be famous, I could have done it a very, very long time ago. But it was like, that's just not how I'm programmed, you know? Like, and even with the Kanye situation, he told me like, do you want to be my girlfriend, blah, blah, blah. Like, do you want to go public with our relationship? You said that and I was shocked. Yeah, no, that part was really crazy. And I remember saying like, can we just wait a few weeks? Because we've like met yesterday and like this just feels like really like crazy and then the next day there it was leaked and i remember being like thinking like oh my god did he do this and then i was like no 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 he like would never do it like i'm sure we were just but tapped and they found out it's so hard to believe that men are fame whores i know and i'm so mad at myself for like just like dismissing it and kind of like allowing it and like making an excuse for it you know cuz it was fucked up he should have given me a heads up you know out of yeah. respect like okay. like i would never do that to somebody like i just want to put that on the record like I would never do that to somebody but to give you credit you like didn't put up with it for that long no like, when you're swept up by someone sometimes it takes a lot longer than six weeks for like the dominoes to start falling into place where you're like wait a second are they manipulative yeah. like you kind of put those pieces in place and we're like oh yeah I have to leave tomorrow and it really was like yeah and also I just want to say like obviously he has his manic moments and whatever but he's not this horrible person I think that he has a lot of mental problems Obviously, some things he has done and said are not excusable. And I 
would never try to convince people to like forgive and forget about it. But like in the moment when you're with him, my point is like, he's fun. He's smart. He's interesting. Like he has redeeming qualities, you know, like I wasn't just like there for the fame. Like I was like, oh, this person, like he's a very tortured soul. So am I like we have similar like, you know, issues like I, I could kind of like relate to him in a way. Are you excited to see like where you end up next? I feel like it could be anything. I mean, yes and no. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I'm like, I just hope my dreams come true, you know, um, which is like cheesy, but it's true. What dreams are next? I mean, I, like I said earlier, like, I just hope that, you know, I can make movies and TV shows and kind of be like more in like the puppet master role mm-hmm. instead of puppet, you know, yeah. like that would be so fucking amazing. But I also like, I don't, I don't even think that far ahead in a way because life just happens and, and I don't want to like get my hopes up or be like stressed and whatever. Like I'm really trying to practice like living in the moment more instead of like dwelling on the past, worrying about the future. Like I'm just kind of like, you know what I have today. Do you ever go back to TM? That's what I was just going to say. That's so funny because it really inspired me. Same. Because I have ADD. It's so bad. And I'm really working on being present this year. Should we go to a class? You guys like totally should. And when you're like, it solved eight-year-old me's ADD. I'm like, could it solve 30-year-old me's ADD? You'd have to do it for way longer. Like maybe like 30 minutes a day or something. 20 to 30 minutes. Okay. But no, it would for sure do it. Can I ask romantically? Are you like at all interested in dating again? I feel like I've heard not no. at all. Yeah. Like not at all. And partially it's because I know my patterns and I know how I get like so tunnel vision and like it really like does affect me, you know, like I'm not, I'm, I'm just like not normal when it comes to that kind of stuff. And like, I just feel so strongly about being like a consistent, reliable, like responsible parent that like I would never want to like bring something into the equation that could like potentially alter like how I am Mm -hmm. with my child, you know? I know it's probably like an irrational fear and like nothing would ever change how I am with my son, but like if it's not broke, don't fix it, you know? Like I'm fine. Like I don't, I don't feel like I like need that. Yeah. Like for what? I don't even have a kid and I'm just like "Mm, kind of over dating. It's like not that fun. (laughs) It's really not that fun. And also like the only times I ever feel like I need to start dating are like when I'm feeling like financially insecure. That's so interesting. Yeah. It's always like my immediate next thing is like, okay, well then I have to like go find some like rich guy to date or something. And then immediately it's not like a real fear. It's just like, I feel like everyone has that at some point, even if you are doing well and making money, you're like, what about like five years from now? Like what if like the rug comes out from under me and like everything comes crashing down and my house burns down? I have insurance. I'm like, I'm good. Exactly. Yeah. The only time I ever wish I had a boyfriend is when I'm like really feeling under the weather and I'm like, I wish I had someone to just like take care of you, nurse you. Like not even take care of me, but like do stuff around the house. Like if like a light bulb goes out and I have a cold, I'm like, how could I even begin to turn the light back on? But like usually you are my boyfriend when I'm sick. Like you always (laughs) send me juice and stuff. (laughs) If there's a cockroach or a mouse in her, I'll go over and I'll bike up from bed style, throw out the mouse. <laughs> uh, I know about the mice. I just let them rock, though. They're not hurting anybody. There was one in the studio the other day and she like almost had a nervous meltdown. I don't know. I just feel like in every single apartment, there's always been like mice or whatever. I had an apartment that had rats once. Yeah. But I only stay like once we realized there were rats, we were out within the month. But like if it's like January and I'm like, Ugh, they're cold. Yeah. I get it. I'm like, they're not here to bother me. They're just also really cold. Yes. I'm dead. Wait, what does your belt say? Tighter. I love that. Ooh. Do you have any style advice for people? I'm trying to become stylish. I'm really like really into menswear these days. Like I feel like oversized blazers, oversized dress shirts, oh, really? with like jeans. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> You're on it. You're a style star. But yeah, I'm like about kind of like blurring the gender stuff now. Yeah, I've been I've been really shopping in both sections because I feel like certain stuff fits my straight up and down body better. <laughs> But yeah, I feel like you guys are both look really cute today. Oh my God, thank, thank you. We you. tried our yeah. best for you. Thank well, I'll you. speak for myself. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. I had really bad cramps this morning and I was like, I'm going to put clothes on and see how good I can wear clothes. Do your period today? Yeah. Oh, my! I just finished mine like yesterday. 
I can't believe you were filming Six Months Pregnant. I know. Yeah. And I just recently worked on another project with Steven Soderbergh, the same director. And he had a lot of the same crew on, on set. And, and we like talked about it. They were like, dude, at one point we, we were asking ourselves, like, is she pregnant? Wait, they didn't even know at all? No, they didn't know. And then I was like, oh my God, thank you so much for telling me that. Because the whole month we were filming, I kept thinking, like, I wonder if they know. It's so fucking obvious. So I guess they did know. And there were whispers. So like that confirmed to seven. It. Yeah. That's like late in the game. No, I, I was like huge. That's and when I rewatched that them. movie, I'm like, oh my God, I'm like so, like, I'm sure people were just like, damn, like she really gained weight, you know, but. But were your boobs huge? So people huge. were kind of like. Huge. So like bad people are like, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It was totally fine. And Steven's like the best director to work with ever. He really is like a champion of women, but not just women, but, but like unconventional women and women that like go against the grain or like might be more controversial or just more like interesting. Like he yeah. really like empowers like interesting women. And I love that about him. Like he, he really, he's, he's a safe person. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, like I, I love acting. I think I'm good at it. It's something that comes naturally, but I wouldn't say it's like my, my passion, you yeah. know? It does seem like it's something like really cool to like have the opportunity to, yeah. especially the caliber of projects you've been in. Like, yeah. I'm like, of course, I'm going to take it and, yeah. you know, shut my mouth and fucking do the best job I can. And it's also really like when I go into any acting project, I'm like, OK, what can I learn? That's like not necessarily about the acting, but more about just like the process of filmmaking. Yeah, I'm, I can imagine like learning from them. Exactly. Like I'm just like really l looking at everything. And for when I eventually have my directorial debut. What would whatever. you name your production company? Do you have one? I have one already. What's it called? Extra Virgin Films. Extra Virgin? Extra Virgin. Vir oh, I, like olive oil. Yeah. I love that. Some Italian. I love that. <laughs> I love production company names. Like, yeah, I know. They're so fun. I like needed to like make it something fun. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, thank you so much thank for coming. You guys. I hope you had a good time. This is fun. This is, I'm so happy. I'm, we feel so honored you came out. Oh, stop. I feel so honored to be here. Oh my God. It's so like meta and surreal. I'm like, whoa. I'm going to leave in five minutes and go. My phone is going to be and there you will guys. Be. Yeah. Oh, wait. Can we do a TikTok with you before you oh go? Oh my God. Yeah, of course. Okay, fun. You guys, tune in. Check out our TikTok. Go to the FYP and bye. Down the drain out October 10th. Oh, it was 1010. Did you pick that on purpose? That's, I didn't. What a good date now. I know. A really good date. You look so strong. Thank look you. At you. This is so fun. Intense. It's you. so beautiful. I was reading the printout and I just got in today. And then I saw that we got a note. That's so yeah. I love it. Ashley was like, Claire, there's notes in here. I was crying on uh, the subway. Uh, oh my God. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, down the drain. 1010, 10, a perfect day. Thank you. Thank you.